Hi, welcome to another video in the Designing on Particle series, in which we walk through best practices and recommendations as you build your particle-based products. My name is Manuel Orduño, Solutions Architect here at Particle, and in this video we will cover a very common system design, battery-powered cellular devices. One of the best use cases for particle devices is to do some form of remote monitoring in hard-to-access environments, sending measurements every so often and taking advantage of our cellular connectivity stack. These devices typically have non-standard power arrangements like solar panels and generally strive to be as energy efficient and reliable as possible. So today we will discuss sleep modes for particle devices, when to use them and most importantly when not to use them. We will then go through non-standard power sources and how that affects the PMEC configuration of your devices. Lastly, we will discuss one of the best ways to add resiliency to your products, watchdog timers, that can give us a reliable fail-safe mechanism against firmware lockups. This series is a mix of content training as well as hands-on firmware review. Hopefully, by the end of this video, you'll have a solid understanding of how to apply these features into your battery-powered products. Let's get started. Sleep modes provide a way to power down all or some parts of a particle device. As discussed before, this is mainly done to conserve power when running off a battery. However, you don't necessarily want to go for the lowest power consumption, because that involves trade-offs in the way that you can wake the device, the time to reconnect, and the amount of power used during reconnection. Particle devices have three different sleep modes, stop, ultra-low power or ULP, and hibernate. Stop mode will give you less relative power savings than ULP or hibernate. However, it's also the one with the most wake sources available. The reverse is true for hibernate mode. It will give you the lowest relative power consumption, but only supports a very limited number of wake sources. ULP sits right in the middle, both in terms of relative power consumption and available wake sources. The graph also showcases an important consideration. Shutting down the cellular modem has a big impact in power usage. However, upon waking, the device will take the longest time to publish an event because it needs to reconnect to both the cellular network and the particle cloud. So for example, if you're building a device that needs to report an event immediately, it might make more sense to just stay awake or use cellular standby mode. With this in mind, these are the guidelines you should follow to select the right sleep option for you. The first is, how long can you sleep for? If you're sleeping for then less 10 seconds, you shouldn't use sleep at all and instead just stay awake. If you're sleeping less than 10 minutes, you should never shut down the cell modem because frequently reconnecting to the network may use more power than it saves and your SIM may be banned for aggressive reconnection attempts. From 10 to 15 minutes, using cellular standby or cellular off is a toss up, so we recommend using cellular standby. It's only when you're sleeping more than 15 minutes that using cellular off makes sense. The second is what wake source do you need? Look at the table to the right for an example of the available wake sources available for each sleep mode in our Nordic based devices. You'll want to choose the lowest power mode that has the sources you need to wake. Lastly, I want to clarify that sleep mode behavior is heavily dependent on the specific module you're working on the power architecture on your design and the device OS version you're running. For example, not all devices have the same wake sources for each sleep mode. Or if you're working with a tracker sum, you'll find it has a completely different sleep API to account for the additional peripherals like GNSS and CAN. Please refer to our device's datasheets for the specifics on each module. Let's now dive into Workbench to see a practical application of sleep mode. We'll review a common architecture that cycles through a wake, publish, and sleeping sequence. We'll go over best practices like ensuring we have enough power before attempting to connect, as well as providing adequate time to do a firmware update before going back to sleep again. For this example, we'll be working with a BSOM on an evaluation board, meaning we have our standard PMIC and fuel gauge available. We'll also be powering the device using our standard LiPo battery. Let's head over to Workbench now. For this and the following examples, I'll work on top of a very popular tutorial in the particle codebase called Wake Publish Sleep. I won't go through the full code in detail, 
but instead focus on the sleep implementation and some of the best practices showcased. The link to the repo can be found in this video's description. From the top, you'll see we enabled system threading and set the system mode to semi-automatic. This will allow us to run code immediately and check the battery level before we attempt to connect to the cloud. Then we have some time constants that determine how long we should stay awake for different activities and also how long to sleep for. For this example, we'll be sleeping for 15 minute intervals. Then we have an enum with the different states for our state machine, cycling through connecting to the cloud, publishing data and going back to sleep. Pre-sleep makes the device hold for a few seconds in case there's an OTA update, and if there's one, we go to the firmware update state. Inside setup, before we call particle.connect, we read the battery level using system.batterycharge and if it's below 15%, we go straight to sleep. If not, we start connecting to the cloud and initiate the state machine. The state machine will first wait until we connect to the cloud, then read a dummy pin and publish a simple JSON to the cloud. Then it'll wait 10 seconds in case there's a firmware update and if not, it'll go straight to sleep. In the sleep state, you'll see we have an if preprocessor. We use it to set the appropriate sleep mode depending on our target platform. Since Gen 3 devices like the BSOM do not support wake on time in Hibernate, we set ULP instead. Keep in mind that ULP resumes code execution where it left off, so we call system reset immediately afterwards to reset the device and restart the cycle. The use of finite state machines and time constants make this a very good starting template for your own applications. And remember to read the comments in our documentation to customize this to your needs. The previous example works great if you're working on our standard power architecture. In this section, we'll go through the details of what this architecture is, what are its limitations and when you might need to change the default configuration or even disable it entirely. Most of our devices use these three main components for their power architecture, the BQ24195 PMAC for battery charging and voltage regulation, the MAC17043 field gauge to monitor battery charge, and a single cell 1800 mAh LiPo battery. By default, our PMIC is pre-configured to work with these components out of the box, and in most cases changing the default parameters is not recommended. But let's explore some cases in which this would actually be required. For example, you might want to lower the charge limit if you're using a small solar panel, or you might want to lower the charge current to keep the battery from overheating. Alternatively, you might want to completely disable the PMEC if the ambient temperature is outside the battery's operating temperature range, or if you're using a completely different battery type, as the built-in PMEC might not be compatible and the field gauge will not provide accurate readings. Let's go back to our code to see a practical example of PMEC configuration. For this example, imagine that we're powering our BSOM through a solar power system. Our challenge is that we're deploying in a place that sometimes experiences very high temperatures, so we need to evaluate the ambient temperature and disable charging for safety reasons if we are above 45 degrees Celsius. Let's review the changes needed in our code to set custom PMIC settings and disable charging during extreme temperatures. We first add a new state called temperature check and make it the default. Notice as well, a new function declaration called battery safe to charge, which for purposes of this video is a dummy function but serves as a good placeholder for you to put your temperature logic. Now in setup, you can see how we created a system power configuration object, which allows you to modify four settings for battery charge current and voltage, as well as power source minimum voltage and max current. The values shown are the defaults in milliamps and millivolts respectively, but depending on your actual setup, you might want to lower the voltage on the battery charge or the power source, for example. Please refer to our documentation for the valid values you can pass to this object. Also, keep in mind that the settings are stored in configuration flash and will persist across power downs. 
so you would typically not write them every time the device boots and instead write them only once during your manufacturing assembly. Let's now review the temperature check block. We first call our battery safe to charge function, which should ideally get a valid temperature reading that accounts for hysteresis and return of Boolean. We use the result of the function to determine if we can enable charging or not and set the disabled charging flag accordingly. Note the reverse logic here. To enable charging, you clear the disabled charging flag and set the updated config object as we did before. After this evaluation, the state machine continues with its previous behavior. As you can see, the Power Manager API is very straightforward to use and the recommended way to modify the PMIX settings. But remember that this is only meant for edge cases and for most applications, this might not be needed. As discussed at the beginning of the series, most of these monitoring applications are deployed in remote areas where physical access to the device can be challenging. As such, you want to make sure that your design is as resilient as possible. And for this, you can use a watchdog timer. The watchdog is designed to rescue your device should an unexpected problem prevent code from running. This could be due to a bug in code, memory corruption, or other causes. There are three ways in which you could add a watchdog timer to your product. The first is to use our software-based application watchdog, but it's generally not recommended as in practice it's not very effective at guarding against complex issues. A better option is to add an external hardware watchdog. This is highly effective and could provide additional benefits like a real-time clock, but you have to be very careful with the time at value in order to accommodate for lengthy over-the-air updates or you might risk entering a loop condition if you can service the watchdog on time. Finally, with our latest device OS version, you can use the external watchdog within our module's microcontrollers. This is a great alternative that both saves on bomb costs and is automatically disabled during firmware updates. Remember that a watchdog should be treated as a last resort measure, so try to allocate a large timeout value to avoid potential issues. On always on devices, anything between 4 to 10 minutes is good. And for devices that go to sleep, set a timeout that is 60 to 90 seconds longer than your sleep period. Let's go to Workbench to add a watchdog timer to our code. We will learn how to enable the internal hardware watchdog and also how to customize it depending on the platform you're working on. Let's go into our code one last time to see how the internal hardware watchdog API works. A quick reminder that this is only available in device OS version 5.3 and upwards, so make sure your device has the right version before continuing. Inside setup, you'll find a watchdog.edit method, followed by the timeout. As discussed, it's best to define a timeout likely larger than your sleep time, so we set hours to 17 minutes. Finally, we start the watchdog using watchdog.start. Keep in mind that we will start the watchdog on its default configuration, which means that the watchdog will continue running even during sleep. Although this is a recommended practice, you might want to pause the watchdog during sleep. On commenting line 100, we'll expose the required capabilities to disable the watchdog during sleep. As usual, please refer to our reference documentation for the different capabilities supported by each platform. For example, pausing the watchdog during sleep is actually not supported on real tech devices. The last piece of the puzzle is found at the beginning of loop, where we call watchdog.refresh on every cycle. If, for whatever reason, our device were to hang in an unresponsive state and could not serve as a watchdog, it'll reset at the end of the timeout period. So while certainly simple to use, this is a very effective mechanism to ensure our devices can recover from unexpected issues, and the fact that it's safe to use even during OTA updates makes it a no-brainer for your designs. Let's do a quick recap of all the things we covered in the series. You should now have a better understanding of the different sleep modes and how to select the right one for your application. 
you should also have a better understanding of our PMEC and fuel gauge and how to configure some of their settings depending on your particular power architecture. You should be familiar with the watchdog timers available as well as our recommendations to use them in your design. This tool should give you a great foundation to create your own battery powered solutions. Finally, please make sure to visit our official documentation website for more tutorials and the latest from Particle. Thank you for watching. Until the next time.